I was a great solitary when I was young. I made it my pride to keep aloof, and suffice for my own entertainment. And I may say that I had neither friends nor acquaintances until I met that friend who became my wife and the mother of my children. With one man only was I on private terms. This was R. Northmore, Esquire, of Graydon Easter, in Scotland. We had met at college, and though there was not much liking between us, nor even much intimacy, we were so nearly of a humour that we could associate with ease to both. Misanthropes, we believed ourselves to be, but I have thought since that we were only sulky fellows. It was scarcely a companionship, but a coexistence in unsociability. Northmore's exceptional violence of temper made it no easy affair for him to keep the peace with any one but me, and as he respected my silent ways, and let me come and go as I pleased, I could tolerate his presence without concern. I think we called each other friends. When Northmore took his degree, and I decided to leave the university without one, he invited me on a long visit to Great and Easter, and it was thus that I first became acquainted with the scene of my adventures. The mansion-house of Graydon stood in a bleak stretch of country some three miles from the shore of the German Ocean. It was as large as a barrack, and as it had been built of a soft stone, liable to consume the eager air of the seaside, it was damp and draughty within, and half ruinous without. It was impossible for two young men to lodge with comfort in such a dwelling, but there stood in the northern part of the estate, in a wilderness of links and blowing sand-hills, and between a plantation and the sea, a small pavilion, or belvedere, of modern design, which was exactly suited to our wants. And in this hermitage, speaking little, reading much, and rarely associating except at meals, Northmore and I spent four tempestuous winter months. I might have stayed longer, but one March night there sprung up between us a dispute which rendered my departure necessary. Northmore spoke hotly, I remember and I suppose I must have made some tart rejoinder. He leaped from his chair and grappled me. I had to fight, without exaggeration, for my life, and it was only with great effort that I mastered him, for he was nearly as strong in body as myself, and seemed filled with the devil. The next morning we met on our usual terms, but I judged it more delicate to withdraw, nor did he attempt to dissuade me. It was nine years before I revisited the neighborhood, I travelled at that time with a tilt-cart, a tent, and a cooking-stove, tramping all day beside the wagon, and at night, whenever it was possible, gypsying in a cove of the hills or by the side of a wood. I believe I visited in this manner most of the wild and desolate regions both in England and Scotland, and, as I had neither friends nor relations, I was troubled with no correspondence and had nothing in the nature of headquarters, unless it was the office of my solicitors, from whom I drew my income twice a year. It was a life in which I delighted, and I fully thought to have grown old upon the march, and at last died in a ditch. It was my whole business to find desolate corners, where I could camp without the fear of interruption, and hence, being in another part of the same shire, I bethought me suddenly of the pavilion on the links. No thoroughfare passed within three miles of it. The nearest town, and that was but a fisher village, was at a distance of six or seven. For ten miles of length, and from a depth varying from three miles to half a mile, this belt of barren country lay along the sea. The beach, which was the natural approach, was full of quicksands. Indeed, I may say there is hardly a better place of concealment in the United Kingdom. I determined to pass a week in the sea-wood of Great and Easter, and making a long stage, reached it at about sundown on a wild September day. The country, I have said, was mixed sand-hills and links, links being a Scottish name for sand which has ceased drifting and become more or less solidly covered with turf. The pavilion stood on an even space. A little behind it the wood began in a hedge of elders huddled together by the wind. In front a few tumbled sand-hills stood between it and the sea. An outcropping of rock had formed a bastion for the sand so that there was here a promontory in the coast-line between two shallow bays, and just beyond the tides the rock again cropped out and formed an islet of small dimensions, but strikingly designed. The quicksands were of great extent at low water, and had an infamous reputation in the country. Close in shore, between the islet and the promontory, it was said they would swallow a man in four minutes and a half. 
but there may have been little ground for this precision. The district was alive with rabbits, and haunted by gulls which made a continual piping about the pavilion. On summer days the outlook was bright and even gladsome, but at sundown, in September, with a high wind and a heavy surf rolling in close along the links, the place told of nothing but dead mariners and sea disaster. A ship beating to windward on the horizon, and a huge truncheon of wreck half buried in the sands at my feet, completed the innuendo of the scene. The pavilion, it had been built by the last proprietor, Northmore's uncle, a silly and prodigal virtuoso, presented little signs of age. It was two stories in height, Italian in design, surrounded by a patch of garden in which nothing had prospered but a few coarse flowers, and looked, with its shuttered windows, not like a house that had been deserted, but like one that had never been tenanted by man. Northmore was plainly from home, whether, as usual, sulking in the cabin of his yacht, or in one of his fitful and extravagant appearances in the world of society, I had, of course, no means of guessing. The place had an air of solitude that daunted even a solitary like myself. The wind cried in the chimneys with a strange and wailing note, and it was with a sense of escape, as if I were going indoors, that I turned away and, driving my cart before me, entered the skirts of the wood." The sea-wood of Graydon had been planted to shelter the cultivated fields behind, and check the encroachments of the blowing sand. As you advanced into it from coastward, elders were succeeded by other hardy shrubs, but the timber was all stunted and bushy. It led a life of conflict. The trees were accustomed to swing there all night long in fierce winter tempests, and even in early spring the leaves were already flying, and autumn was beginning, in this exposed plantation. Inland the ground rose into a little hill, which, along with the islet, served as a sailing mark for seamen. When the hill was open of the islet to the north, vessels must bear well to the eastward to clear Graden Ness and the Graden Bullers. In the lower ground a streamlet ran along the trees, and, being dammed with dead leaves and clay of its own carrying, spread out every here and there, and lay in stagnant pools. One or two ruined cottages were dotted about the wood, and, according to Northmore, these were ecclesiastical foundations, and in their time had sheltered pious hermits. I found a den, or a small hollow, where there was a spring of pure water, and there, clearing away the brambles, I pitched the tent, and made a fire to cook my supper. My horse I picketed farther in the woods where there was a patch of sward. The banks of the den not only concealed the light of my fire, but sheltered me from the wind, which was cold as well as high. The life I was leading made me both hardy and frugal. I never drank but water, and rarely eat anything more costly than oatmeal, and I required so little sleep that, although I rose with a peep of the day, I would often lie long awake in the dark or starry watches of the night. Thus in great and seawood, Although I fell thankfully asleep by eight in the evening, I was awake again before eleven, with a full possession of my faculties, and no sense of drowsiness or fatigue. I rose, and sat by the fire, watching the trees and clouds tumultuously tossing and fleeing overhead, and hearkening to the wind and the rollers along the shore, till at length, growing weary of inaction, I quitted the den and strolled toward the borders of the wood. A young moon, buried in mist, gave a faint illumination to my steps, and the light grew brighter as I walked forth into the links. At the same moment the wind, smelling salt of the open ocean and carrying particles of sand, struck me with its full force, so that I had to bow my head. When I raised it again to look about me, I was aware of a light in the pavilion. It was not stationary, but passed from one window to another, as though some one were reviewing the different apartments with a lamp or candle. I watched it for some seconds in great surprise. When I had arrived in the afternoon, the house had been plainly deserted. Now it was as plainly occupied. It was my first idea that a gang of thieves might have broken in and be now ransacking Northmore's cupboards, which were many and not ill-supplied. But what should bring thieves at Great and Easter? And, again, all the shutters had been thrown open, and it would have been more in the character of such gentry to close them. I dismissed the notion, 
and fell back upon another. Northmore himself must have arrived, and was now airing and inspecting the pavilion. I have said that there was no real affection between this man and me, but, had I loved him like a brother, I was then so much more in love with solitude that I should none the less have shunned his company. As it was, I turned and ran for it, and it was with genuine satisfaction that I found myself safely back beside the fire. I had escaped an acquaintance. I should have one more night in comfort. In the morning, I might either slip away before Northmour was abroad, or pay him as short a visit as I chose. But when morning came, I thought the situation so diverting that I forgot my shyness. Northmour was at my mercy. I arranged a good practical jest, though I knew well that my neighbor was not the man to jest with in security, and, chuckling beforehand over its success, took my place among the elders at the edge of the wood, whence I could command the door of the pavilion. The shutters were all once more closed, which I remembered thinking odd, and the house, with its white walls and green Venetians, looked spruce and habitable in the morning light. Hour after hour passed, and still no sign of Northmore. I knew him for a sluggard in the morning, but as it drew on toward noon I lost my patience. To say the truth, I had promised myself to break my fast in the pavilion, and hunger began to prick me sharply. It was a pity to let the opportunity go by without some cause for mirth, but the grosser appetite prevailed, and I relinquished my jest with regret, and sallied from the wood. The appearance of the house affected me as I drew near, with disquietude. It seemed unchanged since last evening, and I had expected it, I scarce knew why, to wear some external signs of habitation. But no, the windows were all closely shuttered, the chimneys breathed no smoke, and the front door itself was closely padlocked. Northmore, therefore, had entered by the back. This was the natural, and indeed the necessary conclusion. And you may judge of my surprise when, on turning the house, I found the back door similarly secured. My mind at once reverted to the original theory of thieves, and I blamed myself sharply for my last night's inaction. I examined all the windows on the lower story, but none of them had been tampered with. I tried the padlocks, but they were both secure. It thus became a problem how the thieves, if thieves they were, had managed to enter the house. They must have got, I reasoned, upon the roof of the outer house where Northmore used to keep his photographic battery, and from thence, either by the window of the study or that of my old bedroom, completed their bulgarious entry. I followed what I supposed was their example, and, getting on the roof, tried the shutters of each room. Both were secure, but I was not to be beaten, and, with a little force, one of them flew open, grazing, as it did so, the back of my hand. I remember, I put the wound to my mouth, and stood for perhaps half a minute licking it like a dog, and mechanically gazing behind me over the waste links and the sea, and, in that space of time, my eye made note of a large schooner yacht some miles to the northeast. Then I threw up the window and climbed in. I went over the house, and nothing can express my mystification. There was no sign of disorder, but, on the contrary, the rooms were unusually clean and pleasant. I found fires laid, ready for lighting, three bedrooms prepared with a luxury quite foreign to Northmore's habits, and with water in the ewes and the beds turned down a table set for three in the dining-room, and an ample supply of cold meats, game, and vegetables on the pantry shelves. There were guests expected, that was plain, but why guests when Northmore hated society? And, above all, why was the house thus stealthily prepared at the dead of night, and why were the shutters closed and the doors padlocked? I faced all traces of my visit and came forth from the window feeling sobered and concerned. The schooner yacht was still in the same place, and it flashed for a moment through my mind that this might be the Red Earl, bringing the owner of the pavilion and his guests. But the vessel's head was set the other way. 2. I returned to the den to cook myself a meal, of which I stood in great need, as well as to care for my horse, whom I had somewhat neglected in the morning. From time to time I went down to the edge of the wood, but there was no change in the pavilion, and not a human creature was seen all day upon the links. The schooner in the offing was the one touch of life within my range of vision. 
She, apparently with no set object, stood off and on, or lay to, hour after hour. But as the evening deepened, she drew steadily nearer. I became more convinced that she carried Northmour and his friends, and that they would probably come ashore after dark, not only because that was of a piece with the secrecy of his preparations, but because the tide would not have flowed sufficiently before eleven to cover great and flow, and the other sea quags that fortify the shore against invaders. All day the wind had been going down, and the sea along with it, but there was a return toward sunset of the heavy weather of the day before. The night set in pitch dark. The wind came off the sea in squalls, like the firing of a battery of cannon. Now and then there was a flaw of rain, and the surf rolled heavier with the rising tide. I was down at my observatory among the elders, when a light was run up to the masthead of the schooner, and showed she was closer in than when I had seen her by the dying daylight. I concluded that this must be a signal to Northmore's associates on shore, and, stepping forth into the links, looked around me for something in response. A small footpath ran along the margin of the wood, and formed the most direct communication between the pavilion and the mansion-house, and, as I cast my eyes to that side, I saw a spark of light, not a quarter of a mile away, and rapidly approaching. From its uneven course it appeared to be the light of a lantern carried by a person who followed the windings of the path, and was often staggered and taken aback by the more violent squalls. I concealed myself once more among the elders, and waited eagerly for the newcomer's advance. It proved to be a woman, and, as she passed within a half-rod of my ambush, I was able to recognize the features. The deaf and silent old dame, who had nursed Northmore in his childhood, was his associate in this underhand affair. I followed her at a little distance, taking advantage of the innumerable heights and hollows, concealed by the darkness, and favored not only by the nurse's deafness, but by the uproar of the wind and surf. She entered the pavilion, and, going at once to the upper story, opened and set a light in one of the windows that looked toward the sea. Immediately afterwards the light at the schooner's masthead was run down and extinguished. Its purpose had been attained, and those on board were sure that they were expected. The old woman resumed her preparations, although the other shutters remained closed, I could see a glimmer going to and fro about the house, and a gush of sparks from one chimney after another soon told me that the fires were being kindled. Northmore and his guests, I was now persuaded, would come ashore as soon as there was water on the flow. It was a wild night for boat service, and I felt some alarm mingle with my curiosity as I reflected on the danger of the landing. My old acquaintance, it was true, was the most eccentric of men, but the present eccentricity was both disquieting and lugubrious to consider. A variety of feelings thus led me towards the beach, where I lay flat on my face in a hollow within six feet of the track that led to the pavilion. Thence I should have the satisfaction of recognizing the arrivals, and, if they should prove to be acquaintances, greeting them as soon as they landed. Some time before eleven, while the tide was still dangerously low, a boat's lantern appeared close in shore and, my attention being thus awakened, I could perceive another still far to seaward, violently tossed and sometimes hidden by the billows. The weather, which was getting dirtier as the night went on, and the perilous situation of the yacht upon a lee shore, had probably driven them to attempt a landing at the earliest possible moment. A little afterwards, four yachtsmen carrying a very heavy chest, and guided by a fifth with a lantern, passed close in front of me as I lay, and were admitted to the pavilion by the nurse. Then they returned to the beach, and passed me a third time, with another chest, larger but apparently not so heavy as the first. A third time they made the transit, and on this occasion one of the yachtsmen carried a leather portmanteau, and the other a lady's trunk and carriage bag. My curiosity was sharply excited. If a woman were among the guests of Northmore, it would show a change in his habits, and an apostasy from his pet theories of life well calculated to fill me with surprise. When he and I dwelt there together, the pavilion had been a temple of misogyny, and now one of the detested sects was to be installed under its roof. I remembered one or two particulars, a few notes of daintiness, and almost coquetry which had struck me the day before, as I surveyed the preparations in the house. 
Their purpose was now clear, and I thought myself dull not to have perceived it from the first. While I was thus reflecting, a second lantern drew near me from the beach. It was carried by a yachtsman, whom I had not yet seen, and who was conducting two other persons to the pavilion. These two persons were unquestionably the guests for whom the house was made ready, and, straining eye and ear, I set myself to watch them as they passed. One was an unusually tall man, in a traveling hat slouched over his eyes, and a highland cape closely buttoned and turned up, so as to conceal his face. You could make out no more of him than that he was, as I have said, unusually tall, and walked feebly with a heavy stoop. By his side, and either clinging to him or giving him support, I could not make out which, was a young, tall, and slender figure of a woman, she was extremely pale, but in the light of the lantern her face was so marred by strong and changing shadows that she might equally well have been as ugly as sin, or as beautiful as I afterwards found her to be. When they were just abreast of me, the girl made some remark, which was drowned by the noise of the wind. Hush, said her companion, and there was something in the tone with which the word was uttered that thrilled and rather shook my spirits. It seemed to breathe from a bosom laboring under the deadliest terror. I had never heard another syllable so expressive, and I still hear it again when I am feverish at night, and my mind runs upon old times. The man turned toward the girl as he spoke. I had a glimpse of much red beard and a nose which seemed to have been broken in youth, and his light eyes seemed shining in his face with some strong and unpleasant emotion. But these two passed on, and were admitted in their turn to the pavilion. One by one, or in groups, the seamen returned to the beach. The wind brought me the sound of a rough voice crying, Shove off! Then, after a pause, another lantern drew near. It was Northmore, alone. My wife and I, a man and a woman, have often agreed to wonder how a person could be, at the same time, so handsome and so repulsive as Northmore. He had the appearance of a finished gentleman. His face bore every mark of intelligence and courage, but you had only to look at him, even in his most amiable moment, to see that he had the temper of a slaver captain. I never knew a character that was both explosive and revengeful to the same degree. He combined the vivacity of the South with the sustained and deadly hatreds of the North and both traits were plainly written on his face, which was a sort of danger signal. In person, he was tall, strong, and active, his hair and complexion very dark, his features handsomely designed, but spoiled by a menacing expression. At that moment he was somewhat paler than by nature. He wore a heavy frown, and his lips worked, and he looked sharply round him as he walked, like a man besieged with apprehensions and yet I thought he had a look of triumph underlying all, as though he had already done much, and was near the end of an achievement. Partly from a scruple of delicacy, which I dare say came too late, partly from the pleasure of startling an acquaintance, I desired to make my presence known to him without delay. I got suddenly to my feet and stepped forward. Northmore, said I, I have never had so shocking a surprise in all my days. He leaped on me without a word, something shone in his hand, and he struck for my heart with a dagger. At the same moment I knocked him head over heels. Whether it was my quickness or his own uncertainty, I know not, but the blade only grazed my shoulder, while the hilt and his fist struck me violently on the mouth. I fled, but not far. I had often and often observed the capabilities of the sand hills for protracted ambush or stealthy advances and retreats and, not ten yards from the scene of the scuffle, plumped down again upon the grass. The lantern had fallen and gone out. But what was my astonishment to see Northmore slip at a bound into the pavilion, and hear him bar the door behind him with a clang of iron? He had not pursued me. He had run away. Northmore, whom I knew for the most implacable and daring of men, had run away. I could scarce believe my reason, and yet, in this strange business, where all was incredible, there was nothing to make a work about in an incredibility, more or less. For why was the pavilion secretly prepared? 
why had Northmore landed with his guests at dead of night in half a gale's wind, and with the flow scarce covered? Why had he sought to kill me? Had he not recognized my voice? I wondered. And, above all, how had he come to have a dagger ready in his hand? A dagger, or even a sharp knife, seemed out of keeping with the age in which we lived, and a gentleman landing from his yacht on the shore of his own estate, even although it was at night, and with some mysterious circumstances, does not usually, as a matter of fact, walk thus prepared for deadly onslaught. The more I reflected, the further I felt at sea. I recapitulated the elements of mystery, counting them on my fingers. The pavilion secretly prepared for guests. The guests landed at the risk of their lives, and to the imminent peril of the yacht. The guests, or at least one of them, in undisguised and seemingly causeless terror. Northmour with a naked weapon. Northmour stabbing his most intimate acquaintance at a word. Last, and not least strange, Northmour fleeing from the man whom he had sought to murder, barricading himself, like a hunted creature, behind the door of the pavilion. Here were at least six separate causes for extreme surprise, each part and parcel with the others, and forming all together one consistent story. I felt almost ashamed to believe my own senses. As I thus stood, transfixed with wonder, I began to grow painfully conscious of the injuries I had received in the scuffle, skulked round among the sand-hills, and, by a devious path, regained the shelter of the wood. On the way, the old nurse passed again within several yards of me, still carrying her lantern, on the return journey to the mansion-house of Graydon. This made a seventh suspicious feature in the case. Northmore and his guests, it appeared, were to cook and do the cleaning for themselves, while the old woman continued to inhabit the big empty barrack among the policies. There must surely be great cause for secrecy, when so many inconveniences were confronted to preserve it. So thinking, I made my way to the den. For greater security, I trod out the embers of the fire, and lighted my lantern to examine the wound upon my shoulder. It was a trifling hurt, although it bled somewhat freely, and I dressed it as well as I could, for its position made it difficult to reach, with some rag and cold water from the spring. While I was thus busied, I mentally declared war against Northmour and his mystery. I am not an angry man by nature, and I believe there was more curiosity than resentment in my heart. But war I certainly declared, and, by way of preparation, I got out my revolver, and, having drawn the charges, cleaned and reloaded it with scrupulous care. Next I became preoccupied about my horse. It might break loose or fall to neighing, and so betray my camp in the sea wood. I determined to rid myself of its neighborhood, and long before dawn I was leading it over the links in the direction of the fisher village. 3. For two days I sulked round the pavilion, profiting by the uneven surface of the links. I became an adept in the necessary tactics. These low hillocks and shallow dells, running one into another, became a kind of cloak of darkness for my enthralling, but perhaps dishonorable, pursuit. Yet, in spite of this advantage, I could learn but little of Northmour or his guests. Fresh provisions were brought under cover of darkness by the old woman from the mansion-house. Northmour and the young lady, sometimes together, but more often singly, would walk for an hour or two at a time on the beach beside the quicksand. I could not but conclude that this promenade was chosen with an eye to secrecy, for the spot was open only to seaward. But it suited me not less excellently. The highest and most accidented of the sand-hills immediately adjoined, and from these, lying flat in a hollow, I could overlook Northmour or the young lady as they walked. The tall man seemed to have disappeared. Not only did he never cross the threshold, but he never so much as showed face at a window, or, at least, not so far as I could see, for I dared not creep forward beyond a certain distance in the day, since the upper floors commanded the bottoms of the links, and at night, when I could venture further, the lower windows were barricaded as if to stand a siege. Sometimes I thought the tall man must be confined to bed, for I remembered the feebleness of his gait and sometimes I thought he must have gone clear away, and that Northmore and the young lady remained alone together in the pavilion. The idea, even then, displeased me. Whether or not this pair were man and wife, I had seen abundant reason to doubt the friendliness of their relation. Although I could hear nothing of what they said, and rarely so much as glean a decided expression on the face of either, 
There was a distance, almost a stiffness, in their bearing which showed them to be either unfamiliar or at enmity. The girl walked faster when she was with Northmour than when she was alone, and I conceived that any inclination between a man and a woman would rather delay than accelerate the step. Moreover, she kept a good yard free of him, and trailed her umbrella, as if it were a barrier on the side between them. Northmour kept sidling closer, and, as the girl retired from his advance, their course lay at a sort of diagonal across the beach, and would have landed them in the surf, had it been long enough continued. But, when this was imminent, the girl would unostentatiously change sides, and put Northmour between her and the sea. I watched these maneuvers, for my part, with high enjoyment and approval, and chuckled to myself at every move. On the morning of the third day, she walked alone for some time, and I perceived, to my great concern, that she was more than once in tears. You will see that my heart was already interested more than I supposed. She had a firm yet airy motion of the body, and carried her head with unimaginable grace. Every step was a thing to look at, and she seemed in my eyes to breathe sweetness and distinction. The day was so agreeable, being calm and sunshiny, with a tranquil sea, and yet with a healthful piquancy and vigor in the air, that, contrary to custom, she was tempted forth a second time to walk. On this occasion she was accompanied by Northmore, and they had been but a short while on the beach, when I saw him take forcible possession of her hand. She struggled and uttered a cry that was almost a scream. I sprung to my feet, unmindful of my strange position, but, ere I had taken a step, I saw Northmore bareheaded and bowing very low, as if to apologize, and dropped again at once into my ambush. A few words were interchanged, and then, with another bow, he left from the beach to return to the pavilion. He passed not far from me, and I could see him, flushed and lowering, and cutting savagely with his cane among the grass. It was not without satisfaction that I recognized my own handiwork in a great cut under his right eye, and a considerable discoloration round the socket. For some time the girl remained where he had left her, looking out past the islet over the bright sea. Then, with a start, as one who throws off preoccupation and puts energy again upon its metal, she broke into a rapid and decisive walk. She also was much incensed by what had passed. She had forgotten where she was, and I beheld her walk straight into the borders of the quicksand, where it is most abrupt and dangerous. Two or three steps further and her life would have been in serious jeopardy, when I slid down the face of the sand hill, which is there precipitous, and, running halfway forward, called to her to stop. She did so, and turned round. There was not a tremor of fear in her behavior, and she marched directly up to me like a queen. I was barefoot, and clad like a common sailor, save for an Egyptian scarf round my waist, and she probably took me at first for some one from the fisher village, straying after bait. As for her, when I thus saw her face to face, her eyes set steadily and imperiously upon mine. I was filled with admiration and astonishment, and thought her even more beautiful than I had looked to find her. Nor could I think enough of one who, acting with so much boldness, yet preserved a maidenly air that was both quaint and engaging, for my wife kept an old-fashioned precision of manner through all her admirable life, an excellent thing in a woman, since it sets another value on her sweet familiarities. "'What does this mean?' she asked. "'You were walking,' I told her, directly into grade and flow. "'You do not belong to these parts,' she said again. "'You speak like an educated man.' "'I believe I have a right to that name,' said I, although in this disguise. But her woman's eyes had already detected the sash. "'Oh,' she said, "'your sash betrays you.' You have said the word betray, I resume. May I ask you not to betray me? I was obliged to disclose myself in your interest, but if Northmour had learned my presence it might be worse than disagreeable for me. Do you know, she asked, to whom you are speaking? Not to Mr. Northmour's wife, I asked by way of answer. She shook her head. All this while she was studying my face with an embarrassing intentness. Then she broke out. You have an honest face. Be honest like your face, sir, and tell me what you want and what you are afraid of. Do you think I could hurt you? I believe you have far more power to injure me. And yet you do not look unkind. What do you mean, you, a gentleman, by skulking like a spy about this desolate place? 
"'Tell me,' she said, "'who is it you hate?' "'I hate no one,' I answered, "'and I fear no one face to face. "'My name is Cassilis, Frank Cassilis. "'I lead the life of a vagabond for my own good pleasure. "'I am one of Northmore's oldest friends, "'and three nights ago, when I addressed him on these links, "'he stabbed me in the shoulder with a knife. "'It was you,' she said. "'Why he did so,' I continued, disregarding the interruption, "'is more than I can guess, and more than I care to know. "'I have not many friends, nor am I very susceptible to friendship, "'but no man shall drive me from a place by terror. "'I had camped in the Graden Sea Wood, ere he came. "'I camp in it still. "'If you think I mean harm to you or yours, madam, "'the remedy is in your hand. "'Tell him that my camp is in Hemlock Den, "'and to-night he can stab me in safety while I sleep.' With this I doffed my cap to her, and scrambled up once more among the sandhills. I do not know why, but I felt a prodigious sense of injustice, and felt like a hero and a martyr, while, as a matter of fact, I had not a word to say in my defense, nor so much as one plausible reason to offer for my conduct. I had stayed at Graden out of a curiosity natural enough, but undignified, and, though there was another motive growing in along with the first, it was not one which, at that period, I could have properly explained to the lady of my heart. Certainly, that night, I thought of no one else, and though her whole conduct and position seemed suspicious, I could not find it in my heart to entertain a doubt of her integrity. I could have staked my life that she was clear of blame, and, though all was dark at the present, that the explanation of the mystery would show her part in these events to be both right and needful. It was true, let me cudgel my imagination as I pleased, that I could invent no theory of her relations to Northmore, but I felt none the less sure of my conclusion, because it was founded on instinct in place of reason, and, as I may say, went to sleep that night with the thought of her under my pillow. Next day she came out about the same hour alone, and as soon as the sand-hills concealed her from the pavilion, drew near to the edge and called me by name in guarded tones. I was astonished to observe that she was deadly pale, and seemingly under the influence of strong emotion. "'Mr. Cassilis!' she cried. "'Mr. Cassilis!' I appeared at once, and leaped down upon the beach. A remarkable air of relief overspread her countenance as soon as she saw me. "'Oh!' she cried with a hoarse sound, like one whose bosom had been lightened of a weight, and then, "'Thank God you are still safe!' she added. "'I knew if you were you would be here. Was this not strange?' So swiftly and wisely does nature prepare our hearts for these great lifelong intimacies, that both my wife and I had been given a presentiment on this the second day of our acquaintance. I had even then hoped that she would seek me. She had felt sure that she would find me. Do not, she went on swiftly, do not stay in this place. Promise me that you will sleep no longer in that wood. You do not know how I suffer. All last night I could not sleep for thinking of your peril. Peril, I repeated. Peril from whom? From Northmore? Not so, she said. Do you think I would tell him after what you said? Not from Northmore, I repeated. Then how? From whom? I see none to be afraid of. You must not ask me, was her reply, for I am not free to tell you. Only believe me, and go hence. Believe me, and go away quickly, quickly, for your life. An appeal to his alarm is never a good plan to rid oneself of a spirited young man. My obstinacy was but increased by what she said, and I made it a point of honor to remain, and her solicitude for my safety still more confirmed me in the resolve. "'You must not think me inquisitive, madam,' I replied. "'But if Graydon is so dangerous a place, you yourself perhaps remain here at some risk.' She only looked at me reproachfully, "'You and your father,' I resumed, but she interrupted me almost with a gasp. "'My father? How do you know that?' she cried. "'I saw you together when you landed,' was my answer, "'and I do not know why, but it seemed satisfactory to both of us, as indeed it was the truth. "'But,' I continued, "'you need have no fear from me. I see that you have some reason to be secret, and you may believe me, your secret is as safe with me as if I were in great and flow.' I have scarcely spoken to any one for years. My horse is my only companion, and even he, poor beast, is not beside me. You see, then, you may count on me for silence. 
So tell me the truth, my dear young lady. Are you not in danger? Mr. Northmore says you are an honorable man, she returned, and I believe it when I see you. I will tell you so much. You are right. We are in dreadful, dreadful danger, and you share it by remaining where you are. Ah, said I, you have heard of me from Northmore, and he gives me a good character? I asked him about you last night, was her reply. I pretended, she hesitated, I pretended to have met you long ago, and spoken to you of him. It was not true, but I could not help myself without betraying you, and you had put me in a difficulty. He praised you highly. And, you may permit me one question, does this danger come from Northmore? I asked. From Mr. Northmore? she cried. Oh, no, he stays with us to share it. While you propose that I should run away, I said, you do not rate me very high. Why should you stay? she asked. You are no friend of ours. I know not what came over me, for I had not been conscious of a similar weakness since I was a child, but I was so mortified by this retort that my eyes pricked and filled with tears as I continued to gaze upon her face. No, no, she said in a changed voice. I did not mean the words so unkindly. It was I who offended, I said, and I held out my hand with a look of appeal that somehow touched her, for she gave me hers at once, and even eagerly. I held it for a while in mine, and gazed into her eyes. It was she who first tore her hand away, and, forgetting all about her request and the promise she had sought to exhort, ran at the top of her speed, and without turning, till she was out of sight. And then I knew that I loved her, and thought in my heart that she, she herself, was not indifferent to my suit. Many a time has she denied it in after days, but it was with a smiling and not a serious denial. For my part, I am sure our hands would not have lain so closely in each other if she had not begun to melt to me already. And, when all is said, it is no great contention since, by her own avowal, she began to love me on the morrow. And yet on the morrow very little took place. She came and called me down as on the day before, upbraided me for lingering at Graydon, and, when she found I was still obdurate, began to ask me more particularly as to my arrival. I told her by what series of accidents I had come to witness their disembarkation, and how I had determined to remain, partly from the interest which had been awakened in me by Northmore's guests, and partly because of his own murderous attack. As to the former, I fear I was disingenuous, and led her to regard herself as having been an attraction to me from the first moment that I saw her on the links. It relieves my heart to make this confession even now, when my wife is with God, and already knows all things, and the honesty of my purpose even in this. For while she lived, although it often pricked my conscience, I had never the hardihood to undeceive her. Even a little secret, in such a married life as ours, is like the rose-leaf which kept the princess from her sleep. From this the talk branched into other subjects, and I told her much about my lonely and wandering existence, she, for her part, giving ear and saying little. Although we spoke very naturally, and latterly on topics that might seem indifferent, we were both sweetly agitated. Too soon it was time for her to go, and we separated, as if by mutual consent, without shaking hands, for both knew that, between us, it was no idle ceremony. The next, and that was the fourth day of our acquaintance, we met in the same spot, but early in the morning, with much familiarity and yet much timidity on either side. While she had once more spoken about my danger, and that, I understood, was her excuse for coming, I, who had prepared a great deal of talk during the night, began to tell her how highly I valued her kind interest, and how no one had ever cared to hear about my life, nor had I ever cared to relate it before yesterday. She interrupted me, saying with vehemence, And yet, if you knew who I was, you would not so much as speak to me. I told her such a thought was madness, and, little as we had met, I counted her already a dear friend, but my protestations seemed only to make her more desperate. My father is in hiding, she cried. My dear, said I, forgetting for the first time to add young lady, what do I care? If I were in hiding twenty times over, would it make one thought of change in you? Ah, but the cause, she cried, the cause, it is... She faltered for a second. It is disgraceful to us. End of section 14
7. The recollection of that afternoon will always be graven on my mind. Northmore and I were persuaded that an attack was imminent, and if it had been in our power to alter in any way the order of events, that power would have been used to precipitate rather than delay the critical moment. The worst was to be anticipated, yet we could conceive no extremity so miserable as the suspense we were now suffering. I have never been an eager, though always a great, reader. But I never knew books so insipid as those which I took up and cast aside that afternoon in the pavilion. Even talk became impossible as the hours went on. One or other was always listening for some sound, or peering from an upstairs window over the links, and yet not a sign indicated the presence of our foes. We debated over and over again my proposal with regard to the money, and had we been in complete possession of our faculties, I am sure we should have condemned it as unwise. But we were flustered with alarm, grasped at a straw, and determined, although it was as much as advertising Mr. Huddlestone's presence in the pavilion, to carry my proposal into effect. The sum was part in specie, part in bank paper, and part in circular notes payable to the name of James Gregory. We took it out, counted it, enclosed it once more in a dispatch box belonging to Northmore, and prepared a letter in Italian which he tied to the handle. It was signed by both of us under oath, and declared that this was all the money which had escaped the failure of the house of Huddlestone. This was, perhaps, the maddest action ever perpetrated by two persons professing to be sane. Had the dispatch box fallen into other hands than those for which it was intended, we stood criminally convicted on our own written testimony. But, as I have said, we were neither of us in a condition to judge soberly, and had a thirst for action that drove us to do something, right or wrong, rather than endure the agony of waiting. Moreover, as we were both convinced that the hollows of the links were alive with hidden spies upon our movements, we hoped that our appearance with the box might lead to a parley, and, perhaps, a compromise. It was nearly three when we issued from the pavilion. The rain had taken off, the sun shone quite cheerfully. I had never seen the gulls fly so close about the house, or approach so fearlessly to human beings. On the very doorstep one flapped heavily past our heads, and uttered its wild cry in my very ear. "'There is an omen for you,' said Northmour, who, like all free thinkers, was much under the influence of superstition. "'They think we are already dead.' I made some light rejoinder, but it was with half my heart, for the circumstance had impressed me. A yard or two before the gate, on a patch of smooth turf, we set down the dispatch-box, and Northmore waved a white handkerchief over his head. Nothing replied. We raised our voices and cried aloud in Italian that we were there as ambassadors to arrange the quarrel, but the stillness remained unbroken, save by the seagulls and the surf. I had a weight at my heart when we desisted, and I saw that even Northmore was unusually pale. He looked over his shoulder nervously, as though he feared that someone had crept between him and the pavilion door. "'By God,' he said in a whisper, "'this is too much for me.' I replied in the same key, "'Suppose there should be none, after all.' "'Look there,' he returned, nodding with his head, as though he had been afraid to point. I glanced in the direction indicated, and there, from the northern quarter of the sea-wood, beheld a thin column of smoke rising steadily against the now cloudless sky. "'Northmore,' I said, we still continued to talk in whispers. It is not possible to endure this suspense. I prefer death fifty times over. Stay you here to watch the pavilion. I will go forward and make sure, if I have to walk right into their camp. He looked once again all around him with puckered eyes, and then nodded assentingly to my proposal. My heart beat like a sledgehammer as I set out walking rapidly in the direction of the smoke, and— Though up to that moment I had felt chill and shivering, I was suddenly conscious of a glow of heat all over my body. The ground in this direction was very uneven. A hundred men might have lain hidden in as many square yards about my path. But I, who had not practiced the business in vain, 
chose such routes as cut at the very root of concealment, and, by keeping along the most convenient ridges, commanded several hollows at a time. It was not long before I was rewarded for my caution. Coming suddenly on to a mound somewhat more elevated than the surrounding hummocks, I saw, not thirty yards away, a man bent almost double, and running as fast as his attitude permitted, along the bottom of a gully. I had dislodged one of the spies from his ambush. As soon as I sighted him, I called loudly both in English and Italian, and he, seeing concealment was no longer possible, straightened himself out, leaped from the gully, and made off as straight as an arrow for the borders of the wood. It was none of my business to pursue. I had learned what I wanted, that we were beleaguered and watched in the pavilion. And I returned at once, and walked as nearly as possible in my old footsteps, to where Northmore awaited me beside the dispatch-box. He was even paler than when I had left him, and his voice shook a little. "'Could you see what he was like?' he asked. "'He kept his back turned,' I replied. "'Let us get into the house, Frank. I don't think I'm a coward, but I can stand no more of this,' he whispered. All was still and sunshiny about the pavilion as we turned to re-enter it. Even the gulls had flown in a wider circuit, and were seen flickering along the beach and sand-hills, and this loneliness terrified me more than a regiment under arms. It was not until the door was barricaded that I could draw a full inspiration and relieve the weight that lay upon my bosom. Northmore and I exchanged a steady glance, and I suppose each made his own reflections on the white and startled aspect of the other. "'You were right,' I said. "'All is over. Shake hands, old man, for the last time.' "'Yes,' replied he. "'I will shake hands, for, as sure as I am here, I bear no malice.' But, remember, if by some impossible accident we should give the slip to those black guards, I'll take the upper hand of you, by fair or foul. Oh, said I, you weary me. He seemed hurt and walked away in silence to the foot of the stairs, where he paused. You do not understand, said he. I am not a swindler, and I guard myself, that is all. I may weary you or not, Mr. Cassilis. I do not care a rush. I speak for my own satisfaction and not for your amusement. You had better go upstairs and court the girl. For my part, I stay here. And I stay with you, I returned. Do you think I would steal a march, even with your permission? Frank, he said, smiling, it's a pity you are an ass, for you have the makings of a man. I think I must be fay today. You cannot irritate me even when you try. Do you know, he continued softly, I think we are the two most miserable men in England, you and I. We have got on to thirty without wife or child, or so much as a shop to look after. Poor, pitiful, lost devils, both. And now we clash about a girl, as if there were not several millions in the United Kingdom. Ah, Frank, Frank, the one who loses his throw, be it you or me, he has my pity. It were better for him. How does the Bible say? that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the depth of the sea. Let us take a drink, he concluded suddenly, but without any levity of tone. I was touched by his words, and consented. He sat down on the table in the dining-room, and held up the glass of sherry to his eye. If you beat me, Frank, he said, I shall take to drink. What will you do if it goes the other way? God knows, I returned. Well, said he. Well, he said, here's a toast in the meantime. Italia irredenta. The remainder of the day was passed in the same dreadful tedium and suspense. I laid the table for dinner, while Northmore and Clara prepared the meal together in the kitchen. I could hear their talk as I went to and fro, and was surprised to find it ran all the time upon myself. Northmore again bracketed us together, and rallied Clara on a choice of husbands, but he continued to speak of me with some feeling, and uttered nothing to my prejudice, unless he included himself in the condemnation. This awakened a sense of gratitude in my heart, which combined with the immediateness of our peril to fill my eyes with tears. After all, I thought, and perhaps the thought was laughably vain, 
we were here three very noble human beings to perish in defense of a thieving banker. Before we sat down to table, I looked forth from an upstairs window. The day was beginning to decline. The links were utterly deserted. The dispatch box still lay untouched where we had left it hours before. Mr. Huddlestone, in a long yellow dressing gown, took one end of the table, Clara the other, while Northmore and I faced each other from the sides. The lamp was brightly trimmed, the wine was good, the viands, although mostly cold, excellent of their sort. We seemed to have agreed tacitly. All reference to the impending catastrophe was carefully avoided, and considering our tragic circumstances, we made a merrier party than could have been expected. From time to time, it is true, Northmore or I would rise from table and make a round of the defences, and on each of these occasions Mr. Huddlestone was recalled to a sense of his tragic predicament, glanced up with ghastly eyes, and bore for an instant on his countenance the stamp of terror. But he hastened to empty his glass, wiped his forehead with his handkerchief, and joined again in the conversation. I was astonished at the wit and information he displayed. Mr. Huddlestone's was certainly no ordinary character. He had read and observed for himself. His gifts were sound, and though I could never have learned to love the man, I began to understand his success in business, and the great respect in which he had been held before his failure. He had, above all, the talent of society, and though I never heard him speak but on this one and most unfavorable occasion, I set him down among the most brilliant conversationalists I ever met. He was relating with great gusto, and seemingly no feeling of shame, the maneuvers of a scoundrelly commission merchant whom he had known and studied in his youth, and we were all listening with an odd mixture of mirth and embarrassment, when our little party was brought abruptly to an end in the most startling manner. A noise, like that of a wet finger on a window-pane, interrupted Mr. Huddlestone's tale, and in an instant we were all four as white as paper, and sat tongue-tied and motionless round the table. "'A snail,' I said at last, for I had heard that these animals made a noise somewhat similar in character. "'Snail be damned,' said Northmour. "'Hush!' The same sound was repeated twice at regular intervals, and then a formidable voice shouted through the shutters the Italian word, Traditore. Mr. Huddlestone threw his head in the air. His eyelids quivered. Next moment he fell insensible below the table. Northmore and I had each run to the armory and seized a gun. Clara was on her feet, with her hand at her throat. We stood waiting, for we thought the hour of attack was certainly come. But second passed after second, and all but the serf remained silent in the neighborhood of the pavilion. Quick, said Northmore, upstairs with him before they come. 8. Somehow or other, by hook and crook, and between the three of us, we got Bernard Huddlestone bundled upstairs and laid on the bed in my uncle's room. During the whole process, which was rough enough, he gave no sign of consciousness, and he remained, as we had thrown him, without changing the position of a finger. His daughter opened his shirt and began to wet his head and bosom, while Northmore and I ran to the window. The weather continued to clear. The moon, which was now about full, had risen and shed a very clear light upon the links. Yet, strain our eyes as we might, we could distinguish nothing moving. A few dark spots, more or less, on the uneven expanse were not to be identified. They might be crouching men. They might be shadows. It was impossible to be sure. "'Thank God,' said Northmore. "'Aggie is not coming to-night.' Aggie was the name of the old nurse. He had not thought of her until now, but that he should think of her at all was a trait that surprised me in the man. We were again reduced to waiting. Northmore bent to the fireplace and spread his hands before the red embers, as if he were cold. I followed him mechanically with my eyes, and in so doing turned my back upon the window. At that moment a very faint report was audible from without, and a ball shivered a pane of glass and buried itself in the shutter two inches from my head. I heard Clara scream, and though I whipped instantly out of range and into a corner, she was there, so to speak, before me, beseeching to know if I were hurt. 
I felt that I could stand to be shot at every day and all day long, with such remarks of solicitude for a reward, and I continued to reassure her with the tenderest caresses and in complete forgetfulness of our situation, till the voice of Northmour recalled me to myself. An air gun, he said. They wish to make no noise. I put Clara aside and looked at him. He was standing with his back to the fire and his hands clasped behind him, and I knew by the black look on his face that passion was boiling within. I had seen just a look before he attacked me that March night in the adjoining chamber, and, though I could make every allowance for his anger, I confess I trembled for the consequences. He gazed straight before him, but he could see us with the tail of his eye, and his temper kept rising like a gale of wind. With regular battle awaiting us outside, this prospect of an internecine strife within the walls began to daunt me. Suddenly, as I was thus closely watching his expression, and prepared against the worst, I saw a change, a flash, a look of relief upon his face. He took up the lamp which stood beside him on the table, and turned to us with an air of some excitement. "'There is one point we must know,' said he. "'Are they going to butcher the lot of us, or only Huddlestone? "'Did they take you for him, or fire at you for your own boyer?' "'They took me for him, for certain,' I replied. "'I am near as tall, and my head is fair.' "'I am going to make sure,' returned Northmore. "'And he stepped up to the window, holding the lamp above his head, "'and stood there, quietly affronting death, for half a minute.' Clara sought to rush forward and pull him from the place of danger, but I had the pardonable selfishness to hold her back by force. Yes, said Northmour, turning coolly from the window, it is only Huddlestone they want. Oh, Mr. Northmour, cried Clara, but found no more to add, the temerity she had just witnessed seeming beyond the reach of words. He, on his part, looked at me, cocking his head, with a fire of triumph in his eyes, and I understood at once that he had thus hazarded his life merely to attract Clara's notice, and depose me from my position as the hero of the hour. He snapped his fingers. The fire is only beginning, he said. When they warm up to their work, they won't be so particular. A voice was now heard hailing us from the entrance. From the window we could see the figure of a man in the moonlight, his face uplifted to ours, and a rag of something white on his extended arm and as we looked right down upon him, though he was a good many yards distant on the links, we could see the moonlight glitter on his eyes. He opened his lips again, and spoke for some minutes on end, in a key so loud that he might have been heard in every corner of the pavilion, and as far away as the borders of the wood. It was the same voice that had already shouted, Tra de Torre, through the shutters of the dining-room. This time it made a complete and clear statement. If the traitor Odlestone were given up, all others should be spared. If not, no one should escape to tell the tale. "'Well, Huddlestone, what do you say to that?' asked Northmour, turning to the bed. Up to that moment the banker had given no sign of life, and I, at least, had supposed him to be still lying in a faint. But he replied at once, and in such tones as I have never heard elsewhere, save from a delirious patient, adjured and besought us not to desert him. It was the most hideous and abject performance that my imagination can conceive. Enough, cried Northmore, and then he threw open the window, leaned out into the night, and in a tone of exultation, and with a total forgetfulness of what was due to the presence of a lady, poured out upon the ambassador a string of the most abominable raillery, both in English and Italian, and bade him be gone where he had come from. I believe that nothing so delighted Northmore at that moment as the thought that we must all infallibly perish before the night was out. Meantime, the Italian put his flag of truce into his pocket and disappeared, at a leisurely pace, among the sand hills. They make honorable war, said Northmour. They are all gentlemen and soldiers. For the credit of the thing, I wish we could change sides, you and I, Frank, and you too, Missy, my darling, and leave that being on the bed to someone else. Tut! Don't look shocked. We are all going post to what they call eternity, and may as well be above board while there's time. As far as I am concerned, if I could first strangle Huddlestone and then get Clara in my arms, I could die with some pride and satisfaction. And as it is, by God, I'll have a kiss. 
Before I could do anything to interfere, he had rudely embraced and repeatedly kissed the resisting girl. Next moment I had pulled him away with fury and flung him heavily against the wall. He laughed loud and long, and I feared his wits had given way under the strain, for even in the best of days he had been a sparing and quiet laugher. Now, Frank, said he, when his mirth was somewhat appeased, it's your turn. Here's my hand. Good-bye. Farewell. Then seeing me stand rigid and indignant, and holding Clara to my side, Man, he broke out, are you angry? Did you think we were going to die with all the airs and graces of society? I took a kiss. I'm glad I did it. And now you can take another, if you like, and square accounts. I turned from him with a feeling of contempt which I did not seek to dissemble. "'As you please,' said he. "'You've been a prig in life, a prig you'll die.' And with that he sat down on a chair, a rifle over his knee, and amused himself with snapping the lock. But I could see that his ebullition of light spirits, the only one I ever knew him to display, had already come to an end, and was succeeded by a sullen, scowling humor." All this time our assailants might have been entering the house, and we been none the wiser. We had in truth almost forgotten the danger that so imminently overhung our days. But just then Mr. Huddlestone uttered a cry, and leaped from the bed. I asked him what was wrong. Fire! he cried. They have set the house on fire! Northmore was on his feet in an instant, and he and I ran through the door of communication with the study. The room was illuminated by a red and angry light. Almost at the moment of our entrance, a tower of flame arose in front of the window, and, with a tingling report, a pain fell inward on the carpet. They had set fire to the lean-to outhouse, where Northmour used to nurse his negatives. "'Hot work,' said Northmour. "'Let us try in your old room.' We ran thither in a breath, threw up the casement and looked forth. Along the whole back wall of the pavilion piles of fuel had been arranged and kindled, and it is probable they had been drenched with mineral oil, for, in spite of the morning's rain, they all burned bravely. The fire had taken a firm hold already on the outhouse, which blazed higher and higher every moment. The back door was in the center of a red-hot bonfire. The eaves we could see, as we looked upward, were already smoldering, for the roof overhung, and was supported by considerable beams of wood. At the same time, hot, pungent and choking volumes of smoke began to fill the house. There was not a human being to be seen to right or left. Ah, well, said Northmore, here's the end, thank God. And we returned to my uncle's room. Mr. Huddlestone was putting on his boots, still violently trembling, but with an air of determination such as I had not hitherto observed. Clara stood close by him, with her cloak in both hands, ready to throw about her shoulder, and a strange look in her eyes, as if she were half hopeful, half doubtful, of her father. "'Well, boys and girls,' said Northmore, "'how about a sally? The oven is heating. It is not good to stay here and be baked. And, for my part, I want to come to my hands with them, and be done.' "'There's nothing else left,' I replied. And both Clara and Mr. Huddlestone, though with a very indifferent intonation, added, "'Nothing.' As we went downstairs the heat was excessive, and the roaring of the fire filled our ears, and we had scarce reached the passage before the stairs window fell in, a branch of flame shot brandishing through the aperture, and the interior of the pavilion became lighted up with that dreadful and fluctuating glare. At the same moment we heard the fall of something heavy and inelastic in the upper story. The whole pavilion, it was plain, had gone alight like a box of matches, and now not only flamed sky high to land and sea, but threatened with every moment to crumble and fall about our ears. Northmore and I cocked our revolvers. Mr. Huddlestone, who had already refused a firearm, put us behind him with a manner of command. "'Let Clara open the door,' said he, "'so, if they fire a volley, she will be protected. And in the meantime stand behind me. I am the scapegoat. My sins have found me out.' I heard him, as I stood breathless by his shoulder, with my pistol ready, pattering off prayers in a tremulous, rapid whisper, and, I confess, horrid as the thought may seem, I despised him for thinking of supplications in a moment so critical and thrilling. In the meantime Clara, who was dead white but still possessed her faculties, had displaced the barricade from the front door. Another moment and she had pulled it open. 
Firelight and moonlight illuminated the links with confused and changeful luster, and far away against the sky we could see a long trail of glowing smoke. Mr. Huddlestone, filled for the moment with a strength greater than his own, struck Northmore and myself a black-hander in the chest, and while we were thus for the moment incapacitated from action, lifting his arms above his head like one about to dive, he ran straight forward out of the pavilion. "'Here am I,' he cried, "'Huddlestone, kill me and spare the others.' His sudden appearance daunted, I suppose, our hidden enemies, for Northmore and I had time to recover, to seize Clara between us, one by each arm, and rush forth to his assistance ere anything further had taken place. But scarce had we passed the threshold when there came near a dozen reports and flashes from every direction among the hollows of the links. Mr. Huddlestone staggered, uttered a weird and freezing cry, threw up his arms over his head, and fell backward on the turf. Traditore, traditore, cried the invisible avengers, and just then a part of the roof of the pavilion fell in, so rapid was the progress of the fire. A loud, vague, and horrible noise accompanied the collapse, and the vast volume of flame went soaring up to heaven. It must have been visible at that moment from twenty miles out at sea, from the shore at Great and Wester, and far inland from the peak of Greysteel, the most eastern summit of the Clodder Hills. Bernard Huddlestone, although God knows what were his obsequies, had a fine pyre at the moment of his death. 9. I should have the greatest difficulty to tell you what followed next after this tragic circumstance. It is all to me, as I look back upon it, mixed, strenuous, and ineffectual, like the struggles of a sleeper in a nightmare. Clara, I remember, uttered a broken sigh, and would have fallen forward to the earth, had not Northmore and I supported her insensible body. I do not think we were attacked. I do not remember even to have seen an assailant, and I believe we deserted Mr. Huddlestone without a glance. I only remember running like a man in a panic, now carrying Clara altogether in my own arms, now sharing her weight with Northmore, now scuffling confusedly for the possession of that dear burden. Why we should have made for my camp in the Hemlock Den, or how we reached it, are points lost for ever to my recollection. The first moment at which I became definitely sure, Clara had been suffered to fall against the outside of my little tent. Northmour and I were tumbling together on the ground, and he, with contained ferocity, was striking from my head with the butt of his revolver. He had already twice wounded me on the scalp, and it is to the consequent loss of blood that I am tempted to attribute the sudden clearness of my mind. I caught him by the wrist. Northmore, I remember saying, you can kill me afterwards. Let us first attend to Clara. He was at that moment uppermost. Scarcely had the words passed my lips when he had leaped to his feet and ran toward the tent. The next moment he was straining Clara to his heart and covering her unconscious hands and face with caresses. Shame, I cried. Shame to you, Northmore. And, giddy though I still was, I struck him repeatedly on the head and shoulders. He relinquished his grasp and faced me in the broken moonlight. I had you under, and I let you go, said he, and now you strike me, coward. You are the coward, I retorted. Did she wish your kisses while she was still sensible of what you wanted? Not she. And now she may be dying, and you waste this precious time and abuse her helplessness, Stand aside and let me help her. He confronted me for a moment, white and menacing. Then suddenly he stepped aside. Help her then, said he. I threw myself on my knees beside her and loosened, as well as I was able, her dress and corset. But while I was thus engaged, a grasp descended on my shoulder. Keep your hands off her, said Northmour fiercely. Do you think I have no blood in my veins? Northmour, I cried, if you will neither help her yourself nor let me do so, do you know that I shall have to kill you? That is better, he cried. Let her die also. Where's the harm? Step aside from that girl and stand up to fight. You will observe, I said, half rising, that I have not kissed her yet. I dare you to, he cried. I do not know what possessed me. It was one of the things I am most ashamed of in my life, though, as my wife used to say, I knew that my kisses would always be welcome were she dead or living. Down I fell upon my knees, parted the hair from her forehead, and, with the dearest respect, 
laid my lips for a moment on that cold brow. It was such a caress as a father might have given. It was such a one as was not unbecoming from a man soon to die to a woman already dead. And now, said I, I am at your service, Mr. Northmore. But I saw, to my surprise, that he had turned his back upon me. Do you hear? I asked. Yes, said he, I do. If you wish to fight, I am ready. If not, go on and save Clara. All is one to me. I did not wait to be twice bidden, but stooping again over Clara, continued my efforts to revive her. She still lay white and lifeless. I began to fear that her sweet spirit had indeed fled beyond recall, and horror and a sense of utter desolation seized upon my heart. I called her by name with the most endearing inflections. I chafed and beat her hands. Now I laid her head low, now supported it against my knee, but all seemed to be in vain, and the lids still lay heavy on her eyes. Northmore, I said, there is my hat. For God's sake, bring some water from the spring. Almost in a moment he was by my side with the water. I have brought it in my own, he said. You do not grudge me the privilege. Northmore, I was beginning to say, as I laved her head and breast, but he interrupted me savagely. Oh, you hush up, he said. The best thing you can do is to say nothing. I had certainly no desire to talk, my mind being swallowed up in concern for my dear love and her condition, so I continued in silence to do my best toward her recovery, and when the hat was empty, returned it to him with one word, more. He had, perhaps, gone several times upon his errand, when Clara reopened her eyes. Now, said he, since she is better, you can spare me, can you not? I wish you good night, Mr. Cassilis. And with that he was gone among the thicket. I made a fire, for I now had no fear of Italians, who had even spared all the little possessions left in my encampment, and, broken as she was by the excitement and the hideous catastrophe of the evening, I managed, in one way or another, by persuasion, encouragement, warmth, and such simple remedies as I could lay my hand on, to bring her back to some composure of mind and strength of body. Day had already come when a sharp, psst, sounded from the thicket, I started from the ground, but the voice of Northmore was heard, adding, in the most tranquil tones, Come here, Cassilis, and alone, I want to show you something. I consulted Clara with my eyes, and, receiving her tacit permission, left her alone, and clambered out of the den. At some distance off I saw Northmore leaning against an elder, and, as soon as he perceived me, he began walking seaward. I had almost overtaken him as he reached the outskirts of the wood. Look! he said, pausing. A couple of steps more brought me out of the foliage. The light of the morning lay cold and clear over that well-known scene. The pavilion was but a blackened wreck. The roof had fallen in, one of the gables had fallen out, and, far and near, the face of the lynx was cicatrized with little patches of burnt firs. Thick smoke still went straight upward in the windowless air of the morning, and a great pile of ardent cinders filled the bare walls of the house, like coals in an open grate. Close by the islet a schooner yacht lay to, and a well-manned boat was pulling vigorously for the shore. "'The Red Earl!' I cried. "'The Red Earl twelve hours too late!' "'Feel in your pocket, Frank. Are you armed?' asked Northmore. I obeyed him, and I think I must have become deadly pale. My revolver had been taken from me. "'You see, I have you in my power,' he continued. I disarmed you last night while you were nursing Clara, but this morning, here, take your pistol. No thanks, he cried, holding up his hand. I do not like them. That is the only way you can annoy me now. He began to walk forward across the links to meet the boat, and I followed a step or two behind. In front of the pavilion I paused to see where Mr. Huddlestone had fallen, but there was no sign of him, nor so much as a trace of blood. Great and flow, said Northmore. He continued to advance till we had come to the head of the beach. No farther, please, said he. Would you like to take her to Graydon House? Thank you, replied I. I shall try to get her to the minister at Graydon Wester. The prow of the boat here grated on the beach, and a sailor jumped ashore with a line in his hand. Wait a minute, lads, cried Northmore, and then lower, and to my private ear. You had better say nothing of all this to her, he added. On the contrary, I broke out, she shall know everything that I can tell. You do not understand, he returned, with an air of great dignity. 
It will be nothing to her. She expects it of me. Good-bye, he added with a nod. I offered him my hand. Excuse me, said he. It's small, I know, but I can't push things quite so far as that. I don't wish any sentimental business, to sit by your hearth with a white-haired wanderer and all that. Quite the contrary. I hope to God I shall never again clap eyes on either of you. Well, God bless you, Northmore, I said heartily. Oh, yes, he returned. He walked down the beach, and the man who was ashore gave him an arm on board, and then shoved off and leaped into the bows himself. Northmore took the tiller, and the boat rose to the waves, and the oars between the theopins sounded crisp and measured in the morning air. They were not yet halfway to the Red Earl, and I was still watching their progress when the sun rose out of the sea. One more word, and my story is done. Years after, Northmore was killed fighting under the colors of the Garibaldi for the liberation of the Tyrol. End of Part 3 and End of the Pavilion on the Links by Robert Louis Stevenson Until the night when Joe arrived home and found Lincoln alighting from a taxicab in front of his door, he had not understood how much more successful than himself Lincoln had been. It was the taxicab that made him realize the fact completely. It seemed a symbol of Lincoln's prosperity. Joe had traveled home to Brooklyn, as usual, in the subway and the elevated, and taxicabs were as much beyond his dreams as French touring cars. Hello, Joe, called Lincoln when he caught sight of him. I telephoned your office to see if I could bring you down with me, but you'd just gone. Joe felt an instant's regret as he thought of the effect of his arrival upon his neighbors. Hello, Link, he replied. I wish you had called me. The subway was fierce tonight, crowded and hot. Awful hot anyway, isn't it? They went up the dingy stairs of the flat house together, talking. Joe fumbling for his key while Lincoln's fingers gripped his other arm. It was the same old Lincoln, Joe saw. Nevertheless, there was a new sense of constraint between the two men, which to Joe at least was very palpable. They were at Joe's door before Lincoln asked, with a certain hesitancy in his voice, How's Mary? Pretty good, Joe answered. Here she is herself. Mary laughed, blushed, and took Lincoln's hat. Come in, boys, she said, and go in front. Dinner's almost ready, and I'll call you in a minute. Now don't fuss, Mary, Lincoln protested. Anything's good enough for me. When Joe asked me down, I told him I'd come after dinner, but he said that wouldn't do. Sure, that's right, Mary assured him. It's a long time since we've eaten together, Link. I mean, we three, she added. The men went into the small front room, the parlor. Come up and sit by the window, Link, where you can get what breeze there is. I won't light the gas, for that would make it hotter. Lincoln took the green rocker by the window and fanned himself with a newspaper. Both men had removed their coats. What I should have done, Joe, he said, was to invited you and Mary down to have supper with me at the island. There's a new Italian table d'hote down there, which is first class, Tosti's. Been there? No, said Joe shortly. He was thinking that his friend was sorry he had come. Well, he didn't blame him. It certainly would be a relief to get out of these wretched rooms for one night. He remembered some little suppers he had enjoyed down at the island during his bachelor days with girls whose society he enjoyed but to whom he owed no... He stopped his reflections at that point and said to Lincoln, It's just about a month you've been back from Utah, isn't it? Yes. Been around much? Many changes? Oh, Lord, yes, Lincoln answered. Why, even in the three years I've been away, the island has become a different place. You remember... Joe was apparently listening while the other rambled on. Occasionally he nodded yes or no, once or twice he laughed, but all the while his thoughts were spinning their own web. Why had he asked his friend here to show him so plainly his own poverty, his own failure? How ashamed of it he was, of this flat in a cheap neighborhood, of the gaudy furniture bought at ridiculously high prices from an installment house, of everything, of himself, of his wife. Mary's voice calling cheerily, come on, come on interrupted both Lincoln's reminiscences and Joe's reflections. The heat seemed intensified in the dining room. It was too hot there to enjoy the meal. Why couldn't Mary have given them something cold, Joe wondered. The roast lamb, the boiled potatoes, the beans, everything increased his repugnance. Lincoln had his hands at his eyes, a habit of his. But to Joe, the action spoke of concealed distaste and perhaps disgust. Mary hovered about the table, adjusting a plate here, another there, 
piling more beans on Lincoln's plate. She was unbecomingly flushed, and a strand of wet hair lay across her forehead. Oh, sit down, Mary, Joe said. She glanced at him quickly. Joe had not been himself lately, but this tone was new. Then she looked at Lincoln to see whether he too had noticed, but Lincoln's gaze was on his plate. She took her seat quietly. There was silence for a time after this. Mary tried to begin a conversation, and Lincoln helped, but Joe sat silent. After a while, Mary and Lincoln had it to themselves. There was a great deal to talk about, for Mary had been a stenographer in the office where both Lincoln and Joe had been clerks. That, of course, was before she had married Joe and before Lincoln had gone west. Same old crowd, hey, Joe? Old Williams, Red, Billy Ridge, Jack, and all the rest? Lincoln finally asked Joe directly. Same old crowd, Joe answered. Any changes? About positions, I mean? Lincoln continued. Joe started. How he wished he could tell him to mind his own business, not to parade his own success before them. But oh, how much more he wished he could tell him he had been made manager, or at least head bookkeeper. But he could not, and it was foolish to get angry. So he answered in a low voice, Nope, same old thing. Mary tried to get Joe's hand beneath the table. It's a shame, Lincoln, she said. Red's been made head bookkeeper, and Joe and I were counting on getting it. Joe was so humiliated that he could hardly remain seated. He felt that he was placed before Lincoln as a visible failure, an object of pity. Why couldn't Mary be still? That was a shame, Joe, Lincoln said. You've been there two years longer than Red. And we were figuring just what we could do with that extra six dollars a week, Mary went on. We were going to move down to Willoughby Street, Joe's old neighborhood, so he could save half an hour going and coming from business. Joe's been looking for another position, but he can't seem to find anything. Lincoln, if you should... For heaven's sakes, Mary... Joe had risen, and his chair fell back with a crash. Don't you know when to shut up? Afterward, Joe remembered how Mary's face went white at his words, and how she, it seemed ridiculous then, wiped her lips with her napkin again and again. Lincoln also arose and put his arm around Joe's shoulder. What's the matter, old man, he said. Something's wrong. Feel sick? The three stood silent for a moment, the others waiting for Joe to speak, thinking that he must be ill. Meanwhile, his thoughts were running like red fire through his brain, burning and searing. Yes, he was sick, sick of it all, of his work, of his home, of his married life. If he hadn't been engaged to marry, he could have gone west with Lincoln. And he, too, could go to dinner at Tosti's and ride in taxicabs and talk casually of prominent men. It was Mary who had robbed him of these things. It was marriage that had killed, or rather crushed, his ambitions, enslaved him, chained him down to poverty and ridicule and... He writhed at the word, pity. Yes, he was sick, sick, sick unto death of it. He remembered that they were waiting for him to compose himself. He looked up, and his glance went directly past Mary's anxious face. It's the heat, I guess, he said. I'm sorry I've been such a fool. He looked around, oh, to be away from them. If you don't mind, he continued, I'll step out into the street for a minute. You wait with Mary, Link, until I return. Don't you think I'd better go with you, Joe? Lincoln offered. Or me, Mary exclaimed. No, I, I think it's best for me to go alone. He smiled curiously at them and went into the bedroom for his hat and coat. In a minute, they heard him in the hall. Goodbye, he called out, and they answered together, Don't be long. Then the door slammed. The heat had been cruel that week. Men lifted their white, sweat-lined faces to the blazing sky apathetically. They were past the triviality of complaint. The sunlight was avoided like a dread thing, and they slunk along the shaded sides of the streets like whipped dogs. The heat stripped the masks from men's faces, stripped them of what lay beneath the masks, of pride, greed, lust, or of love and light, and left the suffering showing naked. Oh, it was unbearably hot that week. But tonight, when Joe came out into the street, the breath of one of those cool waves that suddenly blessed the sun-ridden city was creeping along the sides of the houses and lifting the papers and dust from the gutters. Joe raised his face to it, breathing it in deeply through his open mouth. His thoughts had stopped their mad racing. He was without purpose. All of his subsequent acts that night were without premeditation. He was like an inanimate thing swept on from accident to accident, like one of the scraps of paper that the breeze blew down the street against iron railings, store signs, and lampposts. He walked to the corner, and beneath the light of the lamp, drew from his pocket what money he had. There was $8.75, including five pennies. He divided the amount, throwing the coin left by the division into the street, returned to the entrance of his flat, and dumped half the money into the letter box that bore his name. 
He then walked down the avenue 10 or perhaps 20 blocks. Presently, he boarded a car going in the same direction and rode until it reached a railway station, where he alighted and went into the station. In the waiting room, he read over the bulletins, first consulting a large clock that glared from the wall. It was a quarter after eight. Bulletin number 12 showed that a train would leave at 8.28 for Westbury, Huntington, and Kings Park. He went to the ticket booth. A ticket for Kings Park, please, he said casually. And return, asked the man. No. The transaction left him with three dollars and a few odd cents. He boarded the train and sat without impatience, waiting for it to start. Perhaps the waiting made him think of Mary and Lincoln sitting home waiting for him. He laughed aloud, and people sitting near turned to look at him inquiringly. That night he slept beneath the open sky, sheltered only by what protection a hayrick gave. He had gone to the city from up the state ten years before, and knew the ways of the country. The next morning he breakfasted on milk stolen from a cow as she stood in a field, and on berries gathered along the roadside. Occasionally, with curious indifference, he thought of Mary and Lincoln. He wondered how they had acted when he had not returned, what they had said, how they had looked. He imagined the scenes in the office, the miserable office. How he hated its routine, its monotony, its deadness. He glanced around him at the smiling golden meadows and wide high sky, against the blue of which sailed tiny ships of clouds, silvery white as the down picked from a milkweed pod. Well, that was over, that life. He was free. No thought of returning came to him. Marriage had stifled him, but now he was freed from its bonds. No doubt he had taken a cowardly path, but the fact remains that he was free. He was free to build again. He had his chance of success now, as Lincoln had had his. But for the present, all he wanted was rest, time in which to steady his racked nerves. As for Mary, well, he knew she was perfectly capable of taking care of herself, probably better than he had been able to take care of her. He knew his flight would not affect her material comfort. That, at least, could not be marked down against him. Evening found him asking for supper and a bed at the door of a farmhouse. They were given with fair grace, and in the morning he proffered a dollar bill, which, after some demur, was accepted. Still, he hesitated. Finally, can you give me any work here, he asked the farmer. The man looked doubtful. Any references? Joe shook his head. Mr. Clay, the farmer, did not like to express the doubts he felt. His wife was more favorable. We need help, Will, she said. Joe had an inspiration. Here's my watch. He put the heavy gold piece into the farmer's hands. It was my father's keep it for security. The man's misgivings vanished. Take it back, he said, and stay. And he gave Joe his hand. Long days of work in the open air, long nights of heavy sleep, unbroken by dreams, brought to Joe swelling muscles and tanned cheeks. They brought more. They dulled memory with its many voices. The door that led to memories was bolted and marked unrest. Sundays, however, were troublesome. All the afternoon there was nothing to do. The farmer had two little girls, the younger of whom spent all her spare time with Joe, chatting and asking questions. She helped to pass many hours, and with her tiny hands held shut the door. But Mr. and Mrs. Clay pushed the other way. They were ordinary people, but their quiet content made Joe wonder. They did not say much, but there were glances, instinct, with comfort and pride in each other. They were both nearing fifty, yet there was something in their happiness and content that hurt while it swelled the heart. So July and August went by, and September reigned. And one night in September, not from any sudden accident, not from any touchstone remembrance, the door flew open. It was but the natural force that had been gathering behind it. It had been too completely closed and barred. And with the flood that rushed from it, with its accompanying light, Joe saw himself as he was. He saw what had entered his married life, his and Mary's, and he saw what had broken it. He saw that it was not poverty, the daily toil, the commonplaces that mattered. The trouble was that they had neglected the romance. They had stripped away the glamour. There was no mystery, no allurement left. He saw it all clearly, and he saw that while Mary's hands had helped, his had been the more cruel. Suddenly his thoughts turned to Mary, the woman. He thought of the lovely curve of her tinted cheek, the swell of her bosom beneath the cheap print waist, of her round white arms and her lips. He thought of the little intimate things of their married life, and he cried aloud that he wanted her. God, he wanted her. So it was not the spirit alone that was sending him back. The flesh, too, had its part in that wonderful and imperative call to return. And perhaps, after all, that was as it should be. The next morning, at the first opportunity, he told Mr. Clay that he was going. 
The way in which he told it showed the quality of the light that had entered into his being. I left my wife, he said simply, and now I'm going back to ask her to forgive me. Mr. Clay sighed. Well, you've been a great help, and I'm sorry you have to go. I didn't know. He looked at Joe with curiosity, but the latter's expression, although placid, did not invite questions. When are you going, Joe? he asked. I figured that the best train for me to leave on will be the 618. That'll bring me home about 830. He said goodbye to them that evening. He kissed the children, and when he came to Mrs. Clay, he took her hand and put it to his lips. The woman flushed and half pulled her hand away. You've been awful nice to me, Joe explained. He meant more than the words expressed. Come and see us sometime, Mr. Clay urged. I sure will, said Joe, and bring my wife if I can, he added. He left them standing beneath the two apple trees that sheltered the front steps. When he had gone a little way, Mr. Clay called after him. Goodbye and good luck to you. Joe waved his thanks. Not until he was seated in the train did he have any doubts about finding Mary. His thought visualized the scene on the night he had left. He saw Mary and Lincoln sitting at the disordered table. From the picture leapt the expression of Lincoln's face. Joe suddenly remembered the great tenderness it wore, but he also remembered that the pitying eyes were not on him, but upon Mary. Good old Lincoln, he thought. It was not until half an hour later that the thought of Lincoln made him burn. As the disc of a song revolves on a phonograph, so his mind, in turning, had come upon forgotten incidents in which Lincoln and Mary figured. He recalled Mary saying that Lincoln, a long while ago, had asked her to marry him, and her tender confession that even then he, Joe, was the reason for her refusal. From that time on, the question that continually arose before him was, what has Mary done since I've been away? And always intruding on the question was the face of Lincoln, with its tender eyes fixed on Mary's white face. When he finally reached the corner of the street where he had lived, he was so shaken by doubt that he stopped short. Suppose Mary had moved away. Why should she keep the flat? What use would she have for him now, anyway? He felt it idle to go on. And what of Lincoln came in a flash? This sent him forward with knitted brows and clenched hands. The powerful springs of jealousy were stronger than the sense of his own unworthiness. He did not stop until he had reached the door of the flat house. There he nearly collided with a man coming out. Both started back, and Joe saw that the other man was Lincoln. The two gazed at each other, with distrust on one side, contempt on the other. After a moment, Lincoln spoke, What have you come back for? Joe straightened. To ask Mary if I can stay? I can answer for her, Joe, and spare you both the pain. She's got no further use for you. Joe's light went out, his spirit broken, perhaps too easily. But for the last two hours, doubt had fought skillfully. For a moment, he felt that he must receive the message from Mary herself. I must hear her say that myself, Lincoln, he said. I can't let you, Joe. Mary isn't well. A scene might be dangerous. For her sake, I ask you to go. Is, is it you now, Lincoln? After the divorce, it will be. Lincoln's voice was hard and well-controlled, but his face burned red. Well, goodbye, Lincoln, said Joe, as he turned to walk away unsteadily. He was halfway down the block before he felt Lincoln's wild clutch on his arm and Lincoln's wild voice in his ears crying, Go back, you fool. I can't. I can't. He flung himself over against the wall and stood there sobbing, oblivious of the lighted street and the people passing. Joe did not even glance at him. He turned and in a walk, broken by running, went back. With his mind still dazed, he was at the door of the flat, his home, with hand raised to knock. But his fingers fell on the knob. He turned it and the door opened. It was very dark inside and he felt his way along the hall and into the front room pausing once or twice to listen, wondering why he did not call to her. But he was hardly in the room when he saw that Mary was there, seated by the window, a black silhouette against the gray. He waited for her to speak, but finally he was forced to break the silence with the single word, Mary. You've come back, Joe, she answered. Yes. Why? Her tone was lifeless. To ask you, oh, Mary, what have you been doing? How have you been living? Have you been well? Have you suffered? No, her voice was still calm. I haven't suffered. I got a position as a stenographer under my maiden name, and I've held it all this time, until last week. I've been quite well. They were silent again, while through the darkness crept the sounds of the street, the cries of children, a woman singing, a man's laugh coarsened by drink and ending in an oath, the sliding buzz of the trolley, the whole composite of sounds that is silence to the city dweller, except moments like these that Joe and Mary were living. 
Again, it was Joe who was compelled to speak. Shall, shall I go away again, Mary? He waited for her answer, but it did not come. Shall I? He repeated. He waited again, peering through the blackness. As his eyes became accustomed to the dark, he saw that her arms were on the window sill and her head resting on them. Suddenly, he knew that she was crying. He sprang toward her, and after a moment's hesitation, his hand fell on her shoulder. Mary, he said. She swung around, and her hands clutched him. Oh, Joey. Oh, Joey. And afterward, don't ever go away from me again, Joey. You're the only one, the only one for me. Her voice went low and vibrant, so that he had to bend near to hear, and bending, he felt her quiver. And I need you now more than ever. That's why I had to give up my position. Lean nearer, Joey, so that I can whisper in your ear. He sank to his knees before her, his hands in her lap, clasped by her hands. He was thrilled, tender, bold. The woman before him was a mystery, yet as clear to his eyes as a shallow brook running over pebbles. He was a bit afraid of her, yet wonderfully conscious of her love for him. She was as mysterious, as wonderful, as vital to him as life itself, for the romance had returned. End of The Glamour by Oscar Grave